Welcome to the Brimbank Writers and Readers event. My name is Dimitri Karkmi, I'm a writer and um, an editor. This event is being held on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people, and I wish to acknowledge them as traditional owners and pay my respects to elders past, present and future. The Brimbank Writers and Readers Festival is an annual event that encourages a love of reading, literature and storytelling, it celebrates creativity and diversity and promotes a lifelong learning in Brimbank. The Brimbank City Council is delighted to present the online Brimbank Writers and Readers Festival, a partnership between Brimbank, Libraries and Bowery Online. We would also like to thank our key sponsors, Victoria University. And it's my pleasure today to interview memoirist Olympia Panagiotopoulos. Olympia, tell us um, exactly what is the book about and why did you feel the need to write it? Beneath the Fig Leaves is a memoir. The story unfolds in my mother's garden. It's the spring of 2009 and there on an old wooden bench um, she tells me the stories of the family's life in Greece, the hardships and the struggles of the era, their journey to Australia, and um, there we um, spend a lot of time gardening and talking about recipes and we talk about young romance and beauty secrets and um, we, there's also stories about hunger and um, the effects of war. It um, also captures a lot about my mother's spirit and, and who she was. I um, really felt the need to connect to um, the places that I had never known and um, what it was like for me growing up in um, Two Melbourne, cultures, Melbourne yeah. West and suburbs, yeah. Basically. yeah. And what prompted you to write that narrative? There was something happening mm. in the spring of 2009. I, I think that I was looking for some direction. The girls were growing up. Um, one of them had left for overseas and I made visits to mum more often. Um, and I, I really feel, Dimitri, that there was something there, something was saying to me, pay attention. So then there was, I was gripped with this fear. Mum was 90. What have I been doing? It's all going to be too late. And there was this urgency to write, to write, document, document, everything she said. I hung on every word. At what point did you become aware that there is a book here that I'm, and a story that I want to tell. I think it was because I was discovering something um, that I had never felt before. Uh, presence in the garden, my mum's stories, they were, um, you know, as you know, they were very moving and emotional, but they were also full of joy and, mm. and they were uplifting. And there were stories there of courage and resilience. And I just thought, hey, these are all things that there's a universal story themes going on here. And whilst it might not have been my number one um, aim at the time that it's going to be a book, I knew that I didn't want the stories to end. Yeah. If, if I didn't do this, yeah. my girls would never know. And I also, Dimitri, I had such a hunger. I, I still do. I still do. I, I, I needed to know about my grandparents. I needed to know everything. I needed to know how long did it take you to get to the village shop. Uh, it was because I had never been there. And I didn't really discover that until the last few years. No, well, well, the wonderful thing about um, the, right, the process of that book is that the garden, in a sense, is the central metaphor for the entire book, isn't it? Um, it's it's all about you know life, death, regeneration, rebirth, and everything collapses into it and comes out of it again. And I think the probably the masterstroke of the book for me is that you place your mother right in the middle of all of that. She is inseparable from the garden and the kitchen, 
and such a recognizable figure, you know, for a Greek. Um, it, she's a kind of a universal figure, isn't she? And, and, and I think also what I loved about it was that um, it was very honest. We, um, you know, we talked, uh, I, I wanted her to be very open. I, I recognised that for my mum, a lot of what she was saying, she may never have said before mm. because there's that proud thing going on, you know. Um, but, but I love that I want, and that's where I also say that um, I wanted to know her. There was such a, such a need to really know her, not as my mum. Because as a woman, well, you, well, because we we give everybody a role, and we only we only know them as that role. I didn't. I knew. I knew her as a mother. I knew, but there was so much more to her. I wanted to know: was she afraid? Was she this? Was she that? How did she feel? And through that, that's how how I gained a real strong sense of myself too. And I think that, even though I may not have actually been aware of it at the time, I think there was a lot of that going on, that knowing about her and, and the, the raw, the realness of, of, of how she felt, what she went through, not glossing over yeah. things, allowed me to be, to kind of recognise that truth in me and too. And that's really what um, you begin to realise possibly around about halfway point in the book. Mother has lived alone since 1993, the year father died. We are glad for each other's company. Melbourne has had more rain this year and the garden is at its loveliest. The tree branches are heavy with fruit and the flower heads are bright and alert with well-being. The scent of the garden rises up to meet me, inviting me to stop and admire nature's finest. Pick me, pick me, the herbs and flowers seem to be saying. The garden is peaceful, I tell mother, as we sit in our usual spot under the shade of the fig leaves. Everything that has life has a home in my mother's garden. Nothing is wasted and everything is nurtured and loved, except the bugs and birds, of course. You realise that, yes, this is a story of the mother and her garden and her life, but it's also your story as well. It's, um, it's a coming to a kind of realisation yes. of who you are as, as an Australian, really. Because um, one of the extraordinary things about the book for me is, um, as I said before, you were born here and yet you have such a strong connection to Greece and the Greek culture. Nevertheless, what I liked about it is it is distinctly an Australian woman's story. So tell us a little bit about that, because you said earlier that you were stuck between two cultures. Do you feel that? Um, or how, how would you identify me? When I was a lot younger, so that I was stuck between, right. uh, that I was living, dancing between two worlds, really. And, and um, I had a really, I had an epiphany many years ago that um, as a child, that um, the only child that hadn't been born in Greece, because there were five of us, um, I was trying to fill in the gaps. I was trying to relive a life that, there was, that I hadn't been a part of. And the epiphany was, which was so remarkable for me was, I thought that I was just different at school that I was just different to the Aussie kids at school and I was Greek at home, but I also realised that I felt different to my siblings and that oh, right. was big because so, um, yeah, because I hadn't been born there. But you also felt very different when, when you go to Greece as well. Yes, you, yes. You think you're going home, but you arrive there and you realise you're actually a foreigner in Greece as well. I think those two, um, Dimitri, I think those two cultures obviously are always going to be a part of me. I think it's me, how, and the garden that helped me yeah. to make peace with, yes, the, 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 the story, the book is very much about my parents and the journey, but it's also about 
the things that I discovered and I think and that that time in 2009 um, was very instrumental in me um, coming to terms with a lot of things that um, I hadn't maybe I thought I had but I hadn't really settled within myself and I realized that you know, I was I was really fortunate because I had the blessings of these two cultures, and so I, I needed to kind of the, the things shifted a little bit for me and helped me a different perspective. And, and and I I think I got that in the garden. I got to see things differently. Typical question for memoir memoirists: Did writing the book um, facilitate that process? Did you come to terms with a lot of those things? by writing the book Absolutely. and the editing process and yeah, so on, which yeah. I imagine would have been yeah. quite long Oh, Oh, well, the, the editing took half the time. The first four years or so was getting everything down, trying to, you know, I was creating a book. I, I was writing notes, but um, uh, that wasn't the book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As you know, then yeah. you had to get it into a book form. There was a lot of stages to this book. It was totally different to the novels that I had written and um, it involved, as I said, a lot of, um, it started with taking notes, documenting, or the whole book other than my childhood is actually a translation. So it was told to me in Greek. So mum's talking, I'm taking notes. There was a lot of photography. Um, there was learning about plants and herbs. There was the recipes. So it was very involved, lots of different stages. Um, and then there was the documenting. Um, I didn't take the computer into the garden. So, you know, gathering ingredients, produce, that was all part of the book. And then I'd go home and I'd uh, write up my notes, but there was a lot of other things, for example, having to clarify with mum, you know, um, the, the recipes, um, mum, nothing was written down, um, everything was in handfuls and pinches, so I'd have to be next to her, oh, how much was that? Oh, I don't know, and she'd do it before I'd even had a chance to get my pen out, so we'd have to start again. Was there a lot of research in terms of the histor historical material? Um, the early, the first chapter, I mean, is um, about your father and your mother in the village. Um, did you do a lot of research for that or did you just talk to your mother? Um, no, there was a lot of research. Of course, um, I wasn't in Greece. No, no. you didn't go there till 19. 81, yeah. I have a cousin that I'm really connected to, my cousin George, he's in the book. But um, I did research some of the towns that are mentioned in the book, the villages. There was research on the ship, the Tasmania, through National Archives. That was the ship that my parents came out to in 55. And then there was the, um, five years ago, we went back to Bonagilla. We took mum to the migrant camp. and. And that was really important. I did a lot of research there. I kept looking at photos and whatever they, whatever I could get my hands on. And um, going back was really good because it, it enabled me to, as I was editing and and um, get a more authentic and clearer understanding of what it was actually like. Because um, as I'm writing, I'm writing the book through Mum's stories. Yeah. There weren't many opportunities for me <laughs> to experience, so doing that was really. Um, you know. Tell me, one of the things I wrote, as you know, I wrote a memoir called Motherland, and um, one of the things that I had to do, and I, and I'm sure many memoirists have to do the same thing, is get permission from people. That they're putting into their into their bo books and stories. Did you have to go through that process, um, or was yours more enclosed? I mean, your mother seems to be okay. But Mum knew we were doing the book, so. Um, and she was okay with that. Oh no, no, she loved it. She loved it. Um, her greatest thing was that um, they would see it in the village and in Peloponnesus. Um, 
and I don't kind of really say it in the book, was that, that you, you may remember when I arrive at her door and she's hanging white petticoats all over the yard for the birds. And she says to me, she sees me photographing the petticoats and she says, you won't tell anyone about the petticoats. <laughs> and I said, no, mum. She says, why are you photographing them? I says, oh, just for myself, mum. She goes, you promise you won't tell anybody? Well, of course. It was hard. I didn't put them in the book, but it was the only thing she ever kind of didn't want me to share. <laughs> Her underwear all over the backyard. <laughs> One of the wonderful things about the book for me was to observe the structure that you used um, to tell this very complicated story um, and that takes place over um, a great period of time. So you have um, the exposition sections which um, focus on your mum and dad in Greece, young people getting falling in love, getting married, coming out to Australia, making a life for themselves. And that is interspersed with what you call the garden journal, um, broken into um, seasons. And then at the very end, you have um, a section which is, for me, my favourite, um, all the recipes that your mum cooked. So. Uh, how did you settle on that structure or did it sort of suggest itself quite naturally? Um, no, definitely not naturally. Not for me in the beginning anyway. The book was actually a series of 52 chapters. Oh. And then um, I was working with an editor um, and um, we did recognise that the, the journals are the heart and soul of the book. So I wanted to bring the reader into the garden with me. So um, the stories, um, you know, mum and I would be in the garden and then something would trigger a memory and we'd go back, we'd dip back and then we'd come back into the present. And so every journal entry was like that. And as you said, the journals were interspersed with interludes, so to speak. Um, and I just felt that it worked beautifully because um, going back and coming back into the present and going back into the past, I think enabled you to connect, have a greater connection to the story, to be more present. And I think, well, some of the greatest compliments I get are that um, I felt, I, I know your mum, I was there drinking tea, the cake tasted beautifully, beautiful, and, and all that, that, that richness and, and that to me, I think, well, the book succeeded in that structure because, and then the recipes were going to be at the end of every season, but we didn't want, I didn't want I, I didn't want anything to interrupt the journals. Yeah. You needed to be present, you didn't need to come out. And so we, I was very careful in, they, they seem very simply done, but there was a lot of um, finessing. <laughs> and even when I write that in my um, epilogue, how the time came when I just knew that I was done. It was just the most extraordinary feeling. There was no more angst, there was no more fear, there was no more, am I gonna get it all done? I need to do this, I need to do, 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 do. It was just done. There was just this, almost like how it began. Almost how it began. Um, not the urgency of doing it, but just this, um, this feeling of knowing. Then there was the feeling of that, this journey yeah, it's time for the next one yeah. and, and um, it leaves off around 2012-13 and now I'm taking on a new path. Um, as we um, wrap up, um, can you just tell us which five books would you take if you were stranded on a desert island? Of course I'd take my book. <laughs> <laughs> Beneath a fig <laughs> leaves for sure. Um, the Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. Loved, loved that book. Um, My Brilliant Friend by Elena Ferranti. It's, uh -huh. it's the first book in the series of four, the Neapolitan novels. A Course in Miracles, that's by my bed all the time. Um, Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. Oh, marvellous book. This one I do know. And Jane Eyre. 
Oh, Charlotte Bronte. Yeah. So is that that's five? That's yeah. five. Yeah. So that's what well I Well chosen. Yeah. The last three especially. <laughs> <laughs> Olympia, thank you very much for joining oh. us um, today to talk about Beneath the Fig Leaf. Um, I hope it does extremely well thank for you. Thank you so much. And maybe many more to come as well. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure talking with you.